Namaskar. Um, so, uh, can I just get a show of hands? Uh, who who knows about Hazelcast? Okay. Yeah. So we we um, started Hazelcast uh, about eight years ago as an in-memory data grid. So an in-memory. So we, um, as you know, an in-memory data grid is a, uh, a type of distributed cache. It also has richer additional APIs, distributed concurrency, uh, utilities, locking utilities, um, pretty much everything that's in um, Java 5's Java Util Concurrent, we have distributed versions of this in, in Hazelcast. The, um, there's also um, um, entry processor, which is a type of in-memory um, in computation, and there's also a uh, distributed executor service which is like the executor service, but distributed in the in Java Util Concurrent. So that's that's Hazelcast in memory data grid. Um, it's predominantly used in uh, it's, it's it starts with caching, but the the deeper usages of that technology usually ends up with about five or six APIs being used, and financial services is a strong is a strong uh, use case for that. Uh, yesterday I went to Ola, the uh, Indian homegrown uh, competitor to Uber, and they extensively use uh, Hazelcast. Um, all of the, uh, all of the uh, drivers, all of the riders, uh, each of the rides, everything is actually stored in Hazelcast. So um, you can think about it as, as a fast, you know, there's, you can sort of, there's metaphors. You can think of it as a distributed cache. You can think of it as an in-memory store. Um, you know, you can think of it as a Swiss army knife of um, distributed concurrency utilities. So there's a lot that you can do with Hazelcast. What I'm going to talk to you about today is, uh, is Hazelcast Jet. So Hazelcast Jet is our, um, our entrant in a, really a separate problem domain and this is the problem domain of uh, distributed data processing. Now, Hazelcast does a bit of distributed data processing centered around the data that it stores in its maps and caches. But JET is, is a processing engine. So the right metaphor to think of with JET is to think of it as um, comparative to Hadoop, comparative to Spark, to Flink, um, Kafka Streams, and so on. Um, now, um, now Jet, like Spark, like Flink, is based on um, directed acyclic graphs. So rather than being um, based on the older conceptual model of MapReduce, it's based on the more up-to-date model of, of DAGs. So you can think of Jet as a DAG processing engine. So why do we do this? We've been going for eight years very happily with uh, Hazelcast. Hazelcast, by the way, we have a little um, phone home built into Hazelcast. It's in the reference manual. You can turn it off. Uh, you can turn it off in the config. You can turn it off in the command line. But by default, it sends anonymized data to us. So at the moment, we have about, uh, for, for March, we had 24 million phone homes from, from Hazelcast in memory data grid. So a phone home is sent every time a Hazelcast member starts and then once per day. So there's a, there's a lot of anonymized information, but one, um, it's our very own you know, big data problem, but, but one interesting um, observation is that just based on, on that alone, it looks like, the, like Hazelcast use has increased by four times over the last three years. So it's going, it's, going, you know, it's, it's a very, very widely used technology um, Hazelcast is an Apache 2 open source project, so anybody and everybody can use it or embed it in their, their product or whatnot. Um, but we, when we considered Java 8 and Java 8's uh, Java Util Stream, we thought about how did we want to handle that. So we could actually, you know, um, so once you up the language level to Java 8, um, then um, concurrent maps actually got, uh, you've got streaming maps to deal with. So did we want to deal with that in Hazelcast or not? So we actually thought that things like Kafka streaming, things like Flink and Hadoop, this is really a separate problem. 
So we didn't want to just bury this functionality in Hazelcast, and we also weren't sure that it would actually be that successful if we did so. So instead, we actually uh, started a new open source project about two and a quarter years ago, and we did our first release in February. Um, so, um, the, uh, so that's, I guess that's kind of the why. Um, I suppose actually one, one, final, one final answer on the why is it was kind of also done as a, um, as a bet at a pub in San Francisco. So we had Chris Wenzel, who was the um, creator of um, Cascading, who, um, who said, you know, um, I would like to run Cascading on some in-memory technology. If in-memory data grids are fast, why can't you guys be great for Cascading? And he'd um, talk to different projects about doing that. So that was kind of, I guess, the personal aspect of why we got started. So, <coughs> so Hazelcast Jet, just like those other projects, is really aimed at doing the same thing as they are, which is that you have um, ingest, um, you do processing, uh, and then you actually send the data uh, back out somewhere. So just, I guess, some, some sort of key points on this slide. Has, uh, JET is designed for both batch processing, fast batch processing, and also for stream processing. Now, we, re uh, we released uh, point, point 0.3 in, um, in February, and then point 0.3, point 0.1. Point 0.4 that comes out in May is the first release that's actually going to explicitly support stream processing with windowing. So for today, the initial release uh, is batch only, but, we, um, but we're extending it to stream. Now we can, um, we can read in from those sources and then Jet, Jet can also read from Hazelcast. So if you're a Hazelcast user today and you want to do some very, very fast uh, processing of data that's in a map or a cache, um, then you can, you can use Jet for that. The other thing is that Let's imagine that you set up a job and you've actually got some enrichment data and you've got that stored in Hazelcast. You can also easily suck that in uh, to Hazelcast Jet. And then in terms of uh, sending data out, um, once again, great support for Hazelcast as a sync, uh, but also all of the other standard things. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, here's the architecture. So, uh, we've been able to reuse uh, a lot of uh, Hazelcast. You can see down there um, the uh, partition management, cluster management. So cluster management today is actually quite a complex thing because of the, all, the comp all the deployment environments. So, um, you know, we support pretty much every cloud and deployment environment that's out there. Um, and, and Jet inherits all of that. Um, So then the engine is built on top of that, and then we have APIs uh, built on top of that. Um, there's also this concept of connectors. So I'll, in this talk, you know, if you kind of picture this in your head, and then I'm going to drill into kind of each of these boxes. So probably at this point, the very, very first question that I'm sure you have in your minds is, you know, <laughs> getting somebody nodding up there. There you go. I, was, I knew the question was coming. So, so, okay, it's fine. We already have all these existing projects, most of which are open source, that I can just go and use. So, so why would I actually want to use this? Or why should I think about wanting to use this as opposed to something else? So the first answer is that if you already are using Hazelcast, then this is the simplest possible way to get data in and out. It's first class support. It's very, very simple. Um, the, the other one, the other thing is that Hazelcast's, Hazelcast really built its, its following based on its simplicity. It was partly an accident of timing when um, the in-memory data grids go back 12 or 13 years actually, but and Hazelcast is only eight years old. Um, so when we, when we came along with uh, Hazelcast, we could actually leverage Java Util 5. So Hazelcast is actually the only one of these in-memory data grids whose API is actually built uh, using Java Util Concurrent. So basically take something that you already know 
and then it just makes it distributed. How easy is that? Fantastic. The world of, um, the world of DAG is a little bit more complicated than that, but what we, uh, what we do, and I'll show you, is we offer two APIs. We offer a very simple API, and then we offer a more complex, powerful API. And we're trying to, at the moment, extend the simple one out to be able to do more, and then take the, the more complicated one. By complicated, it's sort of a similar API to what you see in the other products, and extend it down, adding more uh, sort of utility methods. But we think it's going to be refreshingly simple. If you're, if you're a Java programmer, refreshingly simple. You don't have to go and learn Scala. You don't have to uh, really uh, learn a lot beyond what you already know. You do need to know, basically, I guess, DAG theory. However, um, you can't get past that. Very simple to deploy. Exactly the same ways that you can deploy Hazelcast, you can deploy here. So um, um, I've actually, so Hazelcast, Hazelcast can be deployed client server, or you can also embed it. And that's which is making Hazelcast, now that we're moving into microservices, Hazelcast is now very, very popular for microservices. Because um, there's a lot of different ways to use it, but the point is that it doesn't have to have a separate uh, process. So what I think, I think the combina I think that, that you can just add Jet, like Hazelcast, into your application, and there's no additional operations complexity. It can make, it does mean that Jet can be thought of as an application level concern. So you as architects and developers can choose to use this to get the job done, notwithstanding that the company you work for probably has another standard. At this point, most people have actually got existing infrastructures in Hadoop or Spark and some are adopting Flink. That's all fine, you can, you, that's there, but if you've got something that's maybe smaller, relatively simpler that you want to get done, you can actually just use Jet for that. Um, I talked before about cloud. Now, performance. We'll talk about performance uh, in a minute. And I guess the final thing is that across this whole big data space, you've got people, you've got um, projects and products that are aiming at different user constituencies. We write developer tools. So, so Hazelcast Jet is by developers for developers. You have to program it, and you have to be a Java developer to program it. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, would somebody mind getting the door, please? Thank you very much. So I guess, like I said before, let's get into here and a little bit into the deployment options. Um, yet, you know, at the end of the day, you can get started with Jet simply by embedding it. Um, now, Jet has, has, just like Hazelcast, it has no dependencies. You can add dependencies if you want to read from Kafka or something, then you have to add a dependency for that. But uh, uh, plain and simple, it's like a 4 meg jar with no dependencies, other, of course, than Hazelcast, which itself has no dependencies. So it's very, very simple to include. Um, we, see, we see really two ways of, of using Jet. If you've got some data, if, if you're, what you're trying to do is Hazelcast uh, centric, um, then you can actually use Jet, you can think of Jet as a superset of Hazelcast, and so you can actually use um, Jet in place of Hazelcast and do your Hazelcast things with Jet and also do your Jet things with Jet. So that's the kind of on the left. So if you're Hazelcast centric, just use Jet. The other thing you can do if you if you've got something larger, um, then you can actually have a Jet compute cluster that you run up, um, either embedded or client server, and then you, it can connect remotely to, to Jet. So this would be where more what you're doing is you're processing data in HDFS or whatever, and it's less Hazelcast centric. All right, so let's talk about performance. So when we started this project, we said we're not going to do this unless um, we can be faster than everybody else. So what we picked as the benchmark was word count. If you recall, um, when Spark was released, that's, I guess, it was its big claim. They picked a word count benchmark and showed that they were faster than, than Hadoop. So this is us versus uh, Hadoop versus Spark. Uh, Spark 2.0, by the way, is slower than Spark 1.6, at least for now. So we're using the Spark 1.6. Then there's Flink and an earlier version of Jet. So you can see that we're about 10x faster than Hadoop, and we're a bit faster than some of these others. 
Now this benchmark, all these benchmarks I'm showing you, all use word count. It is a uh, 10 node uh, perf lab that we have, which is modern machines. Um, and uh, it's using HDFS on spinning disks. So everybody has the same starting point. If you are a Hazelcast user and you want to actually suck data out of maps and caches, it's not sitting on disk, it's already sitting in memory. So that's going to be way, way faster. So that's just something to bear in mind. This is kind of an apples to apples. Um, this is a bit more of a zoom in. This one is um, throughput rather than latency. So this is comparing us, um, comparing us to uh, Spark and Flink. So we're not slower. Um, now, a question that came up, I gave this talk in France um, uh, a month or two back, and somebody asked a really good question. So, so we, one of our APIs is Java Util Stream. So you can actually, um, you can write uh, your own, you know, you can use Java Util Stream with built in a single JVM to actually just run it with its built-in fork join implementation. How do we compare to that? So strangely, strangely, the answer is that reading from HDFS, we're actually faster than built-in fork join. Uh, and it's to do with, it's to do with the, the reading of the data in from HDFS. We did an experiment and we actually preloaded all the data from HDFS into, into memory, into, um, I think it was a map, into memory. And, and then we executed um, fork join and then it was faster. But of course, no one's going to do that trick. So it's very, very quick. Jet is very, very fast. All right, let's, um, let's, drill, into, let's drill into, I guess, um, DAGs and, and what we're doing here. So, so you've probably heard this before, but a directed acyclic graph is, is a flow of processing from um, uh, vertex to vertex, which does not come back around on itself. It's not re-entrant. If it was, it would actually be a cyclic graph. So it's a directed acyclic graph. And it's usually represented this way from left to right. Um, so each vertex is a step in the computation. The, uh, the, st the, the vertexes are connected using edges. Um, and this is actually a very, very common paradigm now um, that's used by all these other systems. Um, so what, what we're going to do, I guess, is just kind of walk you through starting with a naive implementation of word count and what it looks like, kind of how we, how we do our DAG processing. So that's what it would look like if you just basically wrote it in a single JVM. Then if we, if we put this into a DAG format, um, we can say, okay, let's have input, let's tokenize the lines into individual words and let's reduce by actually counting the number of, of words. So you could run this as, as a single threaded DAG. Um, now one of the big speed ups that we get is using um, single producer, single consumer queues. Um, so the Martin Thompson um, thing. Um, so this allows each one of these steps to, to, kind of act, to kind of work at its own speed. And that way you're not slowed down by the slowest part. Um, now the next thing we can do is we can add parallelization. So um, the first way you, that you can paral parallelize is, is you can, uh, given that you're reading from something like HDFS, you can actually um, be, be breaking things into lines in parallel. And then you can, so you can read lines in parallel and then you can tokenize those into words all in parallel. Um, we can also partition because what we're trying to do in word count was we're trying to count the number of instances of each word, what you can do is you can, you can send, for each word, you can send that to a different reducer. Or, if let's say you've got two reducers, as in this example, you can do a hash and you can send and you can basically split your work. Now obviously, you can keep parallelizing this right out. And in, in JET, there's no built-in scaling limits. Um, so, uh, you, it's basically just limited by your hardware and your number of threads. Um, today, hyperthreads basically get you know pretty similar work done to a full thread. So, it's by, in an Intel architecture, it's the number of hyperthreaded uh, cores that you actually have 
um, on, your, on your machines, which is kind of these days is usually around 40, uh, 40 per machine. So in our, um, in our Perf lab, when we run our tests, we, we're really using about you know, all of 400 cores. Now, um, once we go to multiple machines, then you go beyond a single machine boundary, then all you then have to do is you then have to, um, at the right times, do the network hops. Um, now, you, you want to do it at the right times. You want to minimize network hops because they're expensive. So, in here, it would be the final um, combining step. So, that's, that's kind of a walkthrough DAG and the way that you go about building a distributed DAG engine. And you can see where you can get the, the speed ups from. So let's do, dig a little bit more, I guess, into the, the JET concepts. Um, the, so the, the, the first thing in JET is that we have the concept of a job. So you create a job, you execute a job. The job will execute on the, the full cluster. So whether you're submitting it from a, uh, a Hazelcast JET client or you're submitting it from a cluster, it is submitted to the cluster. Now, it runs with an isolated um, class loader. So you pack, it's just very, very similar to Hadoop and Flink. You package, up, you package up everything that you need. It's deployed to every single, uh, every single uh, node, and then it runs. Now, we actually support elasticity. Um, now, we don't support changing it within a job, but let's say, just like Hazelcast, you've got 10 nodes, and then you want to increase that. You can do that dynamically at runtime without having to shut anything down. We also support that in JET. So you, you can actually add nodes, and then the next time you go to run a job, all that is taken into account, and we'll actually execute on all the, all the, all the nodes. Now, um, you can run multiple jobs at once. They all run isolated. Um, now then, within a, within a job, um, each vertex in the graph is represented by a processor. So a processor is what gets the work done, and then, um, we actually connect with edges, which we also call edges. And um, when it comes to, I guess, exploiting the cores available on a machine, we don't have a single processor um, on a machine because then that would only be using one hyperthreaded core. Instead, it's actually a processor is broken down to tasklets, and you can specify a uh, parallel, parallelism level, uh, which is like how many you want to run. On, on each machine. So, um, so everything, every everything that does work in in um, in in Jet is a processor. They don't have to be thread safe. Um, our our uh, sources, our sinks, everything is a processor. Um, we have a bunch of convenience processors. So this is our our kind of full API, and we're trying to make it simpler to use. So we have a whole bunch of convenience processes that we've added, like flat map, filter, etc. Uh, and there's some um, there's some examples. Um, so in in Jet, in Jet, the 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 DAG is deployed to each and every node. So every node runs the whole uh, is capable of running the whole graph. Um, there's there's a bunch in terms of how we get the performance that we get, which will be interesting to some people. Um, um, I'm the, these days, I'm the CEO slash CTO of Hazelcast, so unfortunately, I wasn't truly the brains behind this. I was the visionary behind it, I guess. But we have some very smart people, Jan and Marco and those guys. What I got from them is... Um, and it's on the website, which is jet.hazelcast.org. So if you're interested in what specific recipe makes this thing so fast, that recipe, the guts of it, is actually all here on Hazelcast Jet Performance. So we basically go through, we go through sort of the design. Probably the key thing, the two key things, are these single, presume, single producer, single consumer queues. And then the other one um, is this kind of so-called green threads or work stealing approach. So these are the things, I guess, that you would say are novel about this implementation. Um, 
here's more on the cooperative multi-threading. Um, the idea, the idea here is, is that you have the you have the processes broken into tasklets. You have tasklets of different types. You have a core that's just running around and around, and actually avoiding context switching. So we're trying to avoid context switching here. So we've got lock free, single producers, single consumers. Um, we have back pressure. The, if I was to summarize, I guess, the, the, um, the theme of the techniques that have been used in, in um, JET, and may potentially, you know, maybe what it makes it different to the, uh, what you see built into, say, Spark and Flink and, and other modern DAG engines, is the, the team at Hazelcast that built this, um, the guys come out of, um, low latency financial services coding. So there's kind of these, there's these tricks that you accumulate in that industry. Martin Thompson, Peter Laurie, there's a whole bun bunch of low latency tricks that are used. And I suspect that's, when you look at these ideas, they all fit into that theme. Um, there's, there's showing, I guess, tasklets. I talked before about parallelism. So here we've got um, a producer, producer vertex or processor and a consumer and we can set different levels of parallelism and then in the execution service those instances are there and then they get looped around um, so if you if you think of the DAG if you think of the DAG there's um, there's edges between the vertices and so there's we have different types um, there's different types of edges. So we have a, a unicast, which is where, kind of like a round robin, we'll actually pick the next uh, vertex to send data to. Then there's a broadcast where we'll actually send it to all downstream processes. And then there's partitioned, which is probably the most common, where it'll actually route through to the, um, the, uh, the vertex that actually holds that partition. Um, so by the way, um, the, the partitioning scheme of JET is harmonized with the partitioning scheme of Hazelcast to exploit locality. And we also have this kind of sympathetic approach to our connectors so that we also exploit locality um, when ingesting data. Um, a, a vertex um, can have more than one input. So this allows joining and co-grouping. Um, you can also have more than one output, which makes it a split. Sometimes in stream processing systems, these things are called input ports and output ports. Um, another very, very key thing is that edges can be local or they can be distributed. Um, so if they're local, you know that there's no network hop. Uh, and if they're distributed, obviously there is a network hop. Um, in terms of getting data in and out of the, of the system, um, so today we have, we have map and list in Hazelcast. We're adding cache. Uh, we also have very high performance HDFS um, uh, connector. So it's our HDFS connector is what we used in those performance benchmarks with those other projects. Um, Kafka is obviously an extremely important um, uh, system these days, so we have a high performance Kafka. Um, we've also got a uh, file and socket. And then we have, we have, um, we basically have, you know, you can implement your own as well. Um, let's go a little bit more into the, into the um, APIs. So, um, first I'm going to talk about the native API for JET which we call our processor API. Um, this API, in this API, you have to mentally, or even on paper, write down your DAG with all your steps, and you actually build up, you, you create a DAG, and you, you define your vertices and your edges, and then you put it all together and you run it. So you have, it's very, very much about the how. The other API we have is Java Util Stream, and that's where you just talk about what you want to happen. Under the covers, we generate an optimized DAG for you in this lower level API and then execute it on the cluster. 
So um, you can think of our native API as being more or less just as complex as what you'll find in, in, um, in Flink and Spark. And, you'll f and you can think of the Java Util Stream API as being very, very simple. So what we'd recommend that you do is when you're playing with Jet, is you probably out of the box, for your out of the box experience, play with some code samples and get Java Util Stream working so you actually got something happening. And then, and probably only then, is when you think, okay, I can see this working for you, then you invest the time to actually learn about our kind of native API. We, we have, I mean, we did very much want to kind of pull off the same trick that we did with Hazelcast and say, okay, let's bring massive simplicity to this. I've got to say, I think it's an unsolved problem. We think that we can do a lot more with Java Util Stream. We think that we'll be able to use Java Util. So Java Util Stream, most people use Java Util Stream, which has a terminal operation. They use it for batch processing. We're going to play around with it and see if we can actually use it as a stream processing API. So by avoiding the terminal operation. So we will actually produce things so as you know, with, Java Util, uh, with JUS, the idea is when you call the terminal operation that initiates processing, we're going to hack around with it so that we actually have do strict, you don't need to do that. You'll define it, you'll start your job, and then we'll, we'll use those intermediate um, operators to actually get, get stream processing work done. That's, that's work in progress at the moment. But what we're trying to do is use this very simple API and keep extending it across um, so you can get more and more done with that, with def, you know, declaring how you want it done and not worrying about the details. But at some point, if you get into be an advanced JET user, you're going to have to learn this, this API. So, um, can I just give a time check? Where's my timekeeper? My timekeeper is missing. Um, So this session finishes at um, 12 noon, is that right? 12.10, 12.10, okay, so we've got some time. Um, what, I might, what I might do is I might just jump out of the, uh, uh, actually, I'm gonna, what I'll do is I'm just gonna bounce around a little bit. Oops. Um, first of all, I'm just going to give you a look at the APIs. So this one is the, this is the, our kind of, this is our processor API. This is the low level API. Um, what you do is you, uh, you create a DAG, create a DAG, you then define the vertices. So we're just defining, um, and when you think of vertices, your starting point is, okay, where's the data coming from? Where is it going to? So you define the source. Here, the source is coming from a map, so it's going to be an IMAP of Hazelcast. Uh, and then down here, we're actually going to create a sync. And in this example, we're also going to write the data out to, uh, to a map. And then um, this is actually doing word count. So in word count, uh, we create a vertex which actually reads in the lines. Then we create a vertex that actually tokenizes. Um, and we're using flat map, so we generate, um, we generate a new um, uh, stream item for each word, so we emit that. Um, and then we have our reduce, where we uh, you know, group and accumulate uh, by words. So you can see those steps. And like I said before, in this API, you very much got to have that model in your head of what it looks like. And you've actually, for each circle, you need to create a vertex, and for each uh, line connecting them, you then create these edges. So down here, so down here, first we're going to connect um, a source um, to, to our dock lines vertex, which reads the lines. Um, we're actually just going to use local parallelism of one, which means one tasklet will be created. Um, now, it's actually local. It's not defined as, as, as distributed. Um, and then we... Um, so then we connect dock lines 
to the tokenized uh, vertex, and then we um, so then we're going to do the reduce, and this is where we introduce parallelism. So we're actually using the partitioned. Um, so we're doing it partitioned, um, and then um, we do the um, redu uh, the reduce step here, and it's distributed. So if you go back to if you go back to this um, this this over here, you'll see these orange lines. These orange lines need to cross machine boundaries so we can use the whole cluster and actually uh, count the words count the words uh, of each count uh, accumulate the counts for each word so that's what that looks like in the DAG you you add distributed and then finally the last connection is to the sink so we connect from the combiner to the sink uh, and then we execute the job so you kind of see how that API works um, so having sort of looked at that, I guess um, you can, we have some built-in convenience processes um, for sources and sinks. We also have, you know, some convenience ones, but then you can implement your own. Um, the, the other API that we have is uh, distributed Java Util Stream. So I guess, can I get a show of hands? Who with the, the new work that you're doing is working in Java 8? So it's probably about two thirds of the room. So from our phone home data that I was talking about before, um, one of the things that we re started reporting was the Java version that you're using. So we started reporting that about January, February last year. And it was about 40, so this was for like Hazelcast, I think that started with Hazelcast 3.6 uh, or 3.6.2 or something. Um, so we're only, it's only newer, you know, only these very recent versions of Hazelcast and we looked at it and it was started at about 40% Java 8 and then I, every month we saw it climbing. So by the time we got through to about December, we were reporting about 80%, 80% Java 8. So it looks like what I can, from what I can see and just, just what you guys said is that people have kind of, last year, 2016, I think was the year where most people converted over to Java 8. So Jet, Jet uses Java 8. Hazelcast itself is still on Java 6 because we have a lot of existing users. So we do have a plan to come to Java 8, but uh, later this year. So, so here what we've done is we've taken JUS. Now JUS is not a distributed API. Um, so what we've done is we've extended the interfaces to make them distributed. Um, and you, you then use the Java Util Stream API just like you do within a single machine. So this is very much the sort of trick that we did with Hazelcast where we created distributed versions of Java Util Concurrent. We've done this for Java Util Stream. Now, um, so what we do is you declare what you want to happen logically, then we convert that to our processor API and then execute it. So from a, so the paths, the code paths end up being the same. So what does this one look like? Um, so here's, here's more or less the same example that I, that I showed before. Um, here we create, uh, basically create Jet. Um, here's a thing called a stream map. So this is a, um, so this is a Hazelcast map. So we get the map and we convert it to a stream map and then from there we can use it. So we can pass that then um, straight in, into uh, Java Util Stream. So we call stream, we then call flat map, which as you know is built into Java Util Stream. Um, check for, check for um, words that are uh, not missing and then we, sorry, not, not empty. And then we actually use distributed, uh, we use, so JUS has got collectors. We've got distributed collectors and um, we're using the um, we're using to IMAP, it's similar to the um, JUS to map method, and then we're accumulating the counts. So you can see massive difference in massive difference in complexity. So what I might do now is I'll just show you I'll just show you the full code and uh, show you some uh, demos. Now. 
Now, uh, I always think the hardest thing sometimes is, is working out how to get started. So if you're interested and you want to see these code samples, just go to jet.hazelcast.org and uh, go to download. And just like we do with, so Hazelcast has got more than 500 code samples showing how to use, and they're all, they all use main method. It's just like super simple so you get the idea. We think that's the best way to communicate with developers and explain how to do things. Sure, we've got the documentation and everything, but you only go to that after you've already played with the code sample. So you can go and download this, and it's got the, um, the code samples, or you, um, or you check it out from Maven or uh, uh, Docker or Gradle or whatever. Um, you've got the code samples here, or you've got the code samples if you download the bundle. So having done that, Just like with Hazelcast, basically each of, the, each of the various things that we want to do has got a sample. So I'm going to, I'm going to show you, um, so this one here, this one here is the code for word count. So this is word count done, the, done with the full DAG. Now... You see here in the Java doc, we've got this nice little diagram basically explaining the steps. So I'll run that. Now just like with Hazelcast, when you're running a, a demo, this is going to start two, this will start two JET instances on my machine and then submit the job to it. Um, it's, it's a little... Um, Obviously, when, you, when you're forming a Hazel cluster or a JET cluster, it takes a few seconds to form it, and then it fires up. Um, so there's the word count. And then what we do, what we do is, um, what we do is we emit, when we execute a, a DAG, we emit the DAG, what the DAG looks like. So you can kind of visualize it. And what's a useful thing to do is to kind of take this and then put it in a diagram, a graphic diagram. In fact, that's something that we've already got uh, working and we'll be introducing to a, um, we'll be introducing it probably in 0.5. Um, you'll be able to optionally actually print out an ASCII art um, DAG showing you visually what's going on. So that's that one. Um, and then if we, if we then go to the same thing uh, as a Java Util stream, um, so that's the code that I showed you before. This is a full, um, a full code sample. So now I'll run that one. So once again, it's, it's forming a cluster of two nodes. Now, the code that you write, whether you're, regardless of which API you're using, the code you write does not change at all depending on whether you're running this on your machine you're running it on 100 nodes, you're running it client server where you're, you're communicating to the, from, to the cluster with the client API or you're running it embedded. All of that's exactly the same, just like it is in Hazelcast. So there's, the, there's that one running. Now you'll see that what we did, I said before that we take the Java Util Stream API and we convert it to DAG. And once again, we print it out so you can, if you write JUS code, when you run it, you can see exactly how that's being expressed in our DAG API. Um, I'll just, we've got a whole bunch of them here. Um, by the way, we have a, um, so we have, um, we have a non-trivial, um, we have a non-trivial, uh, it's not a code sample. Well, it is a code sample, but it's more of a major finance use case. It's called Bet Leopard. So it's actually how to, um, we, we did this for Spark and, um, and we're actually, it's, it's a sample application. So think Pet Store. So a sample application called Bet Leopard. Um, we're at the moment um, implementing that for, for Jet. It's actually quite enjoyable to um, eat our own dog food, actually. Um, but that'll be coming out. And that's a, that's a non-trivial application that shows how you build an entire complicated application using JET. Um, so let's, let's now, um, so we've got the first 15 million integers. What we're going to do is we're going to work out which ones are primes. Now here we're using our DAG API. 
um, and, and then we'll print out the first thousand. So let me do that. The point about JET is that no matter if you want to find prime numbers or you want to read data in from Kafka or whatever, this should be the fast, and then you, know, you can run this on a whole cluster of machines. This should be about the fastest way that you can actually do this. So there's the, there's the first thousand primes there. And on my machine, that, uh, it found the first million primes and then printed out the first thousand in 429 milliseconds. Okay, so that's, that's uh, the code samples um, and some demos. Now let's just, I've got a few concluding remarks. Um, APIs, um, so Java Util Stream has a single source and single sync. So if you've got that simplicity, um, if you want to use, if you can get your job done using what's built in to JUS, then consider using Java Util Stream. So don't bother going to the full um, API. The other thing is, because Java Util Stream, if you write something in Java Util Stream, you see that it emits code showing what the full API looks like. It's also a great way to actually get familiar with the, the full API. Um, we are on the lookout um, as we keep going. Um, we're on the lookout if there's any other APIs that fit. So you guys probably, has everybody heard of um, the Apache Beam API? So Apache, so Google, Google, um, I should say that we're similar to them rather than being similar to us, but um, they, um, when, they, when they left off from, from, um, from MapReduce, then they, there's a couple of papers, there's Flume um, Java and there's another Mill paper, um, and they've, what they've done is internally at Google, and they've made it available as a managed service, is they've created a thing called Google, um, Google Cloud Dataflow. And so they've, they've got both batching and streaming. And so they've got a unified API to be able to use that. And that's, that's what Apache Beam is. Even though it's Apache Beam, it's just an API. You still need an engine to use it with. So um, we looked at that. It seems to be more complicated than, than our current DAG API. Um, you know, it's, uh, so we, we're keeping a watch out to see whether we implement that. We did actually, back to the, the bet that I had at the pub with Chris Wenzel, um, we did actually implement the cascading API. The problem is, these days, not many people use cascading. So, um, you know, it's got about 600 unit tests. Um, we, we pass them all. Um, so it's great, we have cascading, but once again, just not a, a commonly used API. And it's also quite slow. Um, so what I think is going to happen with our APIs is that we will keep adding things to JUS and we're going to try and get the, stream, the streaming stuff done and we'll also um, try and, and do more to make our DAG API simpler to use through visualization, through added convenience methods and that's just going to happen over time. So I think our API story is going to be emergent. We wanted to do it differently but I think it's just going to be emergent uh, property of the system. Um, I guess just to give, so, so after two years of development, making sure that what we, what we hit the road with was something that was really fast, we got the first version out. Um, and then we've, um, so I guess some, you know, what that looks like in the first release is kind of these major features. Um, we've got, um, got those connectors out. Um, Kafka and HDFS. Um, in terms of the rest of the year, what it's looking like is we've got point, we should get 0 0.4, 0 0.5 and 0 0.6 done. So 0 0.4 is going to be coming out in about another uh, month. It will introduce stream processing for the first time. So we've got windowing, we support tumbling windows and sliding windows. Um, it looks, we don't have all of our perf numbers done yet. We've been benchmarking against Flink. We look to be quite a lot faster than Flink at the moment. Um, we also, when we, when we introduce stream processing, uh, we'll actually also introduce what our guarantees are. So uh, Google, for example, has um, exactly once processing. Um, so we'll actually tell, tell you what our guarantees are and what our trade-offs are. 
this business is all about, stream processing, processing is all about trade-offs. So we'll give you our, what our recipe is. Um, the, the other thing that we'll focus on, the people in this room that were attracted to this talk in the first place are mostly Hazelcast users. So that doesn't come as a surprise to me. We're trying to make this something that's going to be really great for you to use if you're already a Hazelcast user. So other things that are coming is uh, using, using Hazelcast um, maps and caches and so on as stream sources, making that very, very high performance. Um, also, when it comes to map, uh, maps, um, so in 3.8, we added to our query API, we actually added um, projection. Um, uh, we added uh, projection, so we'll, we'll support um, a projection. Today, when you want to when you want to run Jet across a map or a list, it's the whole map or list. Obviously, a better starting point would be to run, in a lot of cases, is to run a query and use the power within Hazelcast so that you just start with, you do your first uh, predicate execution inside Hazelcast and then pump that out. And then you may not need, and then where, where projection comes is that you may not need, thank you, you may not need all the data, so you have projection as well. So that's a nice optimization. <coughs> so look out for more of that. Um, we're also going to add um, JMS and JWC. Um, the other thing, um, I talked before about cloud deployment. So we're actually a premium partner uh, with Pivotal, and we actually have Hazelcast up in Pivotal Cloud Foundry today. And um, we've got our first uh, users of that. So we're also going to add Jet into, uh, into Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, and we, as far as I know, looking at the list, will be the only, there's the other guys that you would expect might be there and not there. So Hazelcast today reaches in to all of these different cloud environments. And so very, very quickly, we're going to make sure that Jet does also. Um, so that's it. Um, uh, if you want to, want to learn more about Jet, um, jet.hazelcast.org. Um, we've got about five engineers that work on this. Um, and if you, hit the, uh, the, the, if you hit the Google group or you hit um, Gitter, um, Stack Overflow, the guys will answer you within minutes. So if you want to get started, um, you'll get excellent um, community support from our JET engineering team. Um, anyway, we are excited to be doing something new after eight years of doing a memory data grid. And uh, yeah, we, um, yeah. Uh, please, please come and have a. Please check it out. Uh, we'll be at the. We've got a booth here. Um, I'll be there. Uh, we've got about. We've got um, a couple of other technical people that are there. Uh, two, two other technical guys. So if you want to sort of learn, learn more about Jet, uh, if you want to play with it, um, come by the booth. Um, so uh, thank you very much for your attention, and um, I'll take any questions. Sorry, what was that? Uh, how are you going to recover from the recover from the faults in between if they are in between tasks? Like in in between map reviews and your combining the tasks, right? Yeah. So how are you going to recover from that? Is there any mechanism available? How are we going to recover what? Faults from failures. Failures in between. Okay, so so what? Okay, so I think the question is about um, fault tolerance. So fault fault tolerance is actually, you know, so what happens if something goes wrong? So um, so Hadoop has the ability to to restart. So we have the same ability. So we so today what we have in Jet is fault detection. So we have fault detection, and then you can catch the exception, and then you can restart the job. Now, that is okay for now, and it's, it's kind of given how fast we are and the types of uh, batch jobs we're thinking of running, I think that's fine. Uh, but it's not suitable for stream processing because in stream processing, um, you know, once, once the streams pass by you, then you can't replay the stream, uh, for the most part. With Kafka, you, you can. Using your, you know, using your pointer, you can basically go back in and replay some records. But yes, so a another um, another uh, thing that we'll be doing. You see the word robust. So what we're going to be doing once we get the initial stream processing version done, 
then we're going to be adding um, further fault tolerant strategies. The approach that we're looking to use, um, we've already done some work on this, is to, is, to, um, uh, is to write, is to actually write to in-memory Hazelcast um, and uh, take checkpoints at each step. So then if something goes wrong, we only have to go back to the previous checkpoint. That's the usual approach that, that these things use. We'll be doing it using in-memory so that we retain the performance. But yeah, great question. So I guess, and it kind of underlines something about JET. So we've come out and we released JET.3. Right? It's called point .3 because it really is point .3. We're doing something new. Um, we're doing it the Hazelcast way. We're doing it the open source way. We think that um, what we've got is, is pretty good for production use for, um, for batch processing. And then we'll add, we'll add streaming and you know, we'll be very, very careful to basically say what the limitations are. Um, but I would, expect, um, I would expect by probably around July or something, we'll probably be adding some of those, um, those um, fault tolerance, other than just detection and restart, fault tolerance for, to support, properly support stream processing. Sorry, what, so... What was the adoption of among Yeah, okay, so the question is, the question is what's adoption looking like? Um, so, so Hazelcast has about uh, 400 forks on GitHub. Um, so we have about 40 forks on GitHub. What I would say, I would say the people that are looking at Jet are the people that sort of look at the, the most red dripping blood, bleeding edge of, of new technology. So for the most part, the people that seem to be initially looking at JET are not really our existing, um, existing Hazelcast users. Um, one thing that I'm seeing is people that are like very smart people that are building stream processing products. So we've got, for one that I've met for example is um, there's a company in Melbourne called Future Grid, and they, um, they sell a product that, that processes data from all these smart meters. Turns out Victoria in Australia was one of the first states in the world to sort of fully adopt smart meters. And so now there's all this legislation about how quickly you've got to, you've got to process the records and so on. So they have a product um, that does that. So they, they will be using JET to, um, to uh, they basically built their own framework and what they'll be doing now is they said, oh, you just made it a lot easier. So we'll be replacing what we did with JET so we don't have to maintain that. And, and that's kind of the theme. A bunch of OEMs, smart OEMs, that before nothing that was out there was really suitable for what they were trying to do. With an OEM, you've got to be embedded. So you really can't afford to have a great big separate runtime infrastructure out there. So I think this is a key attraction. I think this is going to be our first strong user community will be around um, OEMs. And then um, I think um, with, the, with, with Hazelcast, um, I think once we get some of these other things done and, and our own solution architects become more familiar with JET, um, I mean I was, I was um, you know, I've been to two, um, two customers, uh, yet one yesterday and one in Singapore on Monday. And in both cases you had uh, uh, Hazelcast users who also had stream processing or batch problems to solve. So the one in Singapore, they're creating a data lake they want to ingest from files. They were looking at having to run up a Spark infrastructure to do that ingest from files. They're like, you know, what we're trying to do is really simple. It'd be great if we didn't have to go to that. Um, uh, Indian company, um, they were, um, they, they currently use Kafka Streaming uh, Kafka Streaming has got limitations when it comes to Windows, so they, um, they were looking to get away from that. They've also been ex looking at Spark. Spark's not attractive because something else to learn that they don't need right now, and also they don't want to program in Scala. So does that kind of give a flavor for, for what we see happening? I think, I think there'll, be, there'll be that OEM group who are not necessarily existing Hazelcast users, and then I think we'll start out 
with our Hazelcast users, because Jet, if you know Hazelcast, it's, it's pretty, you know, API-wise, deployment-wise, everything actually pretty similar. So I think, I think that will happen, yeah. So Hazelcast itself supports six programming languages, C++, .NET, uh, Java, Scala, which is done as a wrapper around um, Java, uh, uh, Python, and Node.js. We've got a really nice Node.js community now. And in Hazelcast, we have, uh, we have our own published binary protocol, and the clients use that protocol. So they're first class clients. Each, each client is written from scratch. And um, um, so that, that's a really good state of affairs. For today, for JET, we only have um, Java. Um, now, there's no, um, if you're a Scala user, then uh, we did have our Scala guy look at it. And he's like, yeah, it's pretty convenient to use Java 8, these Java 8 ideas and JUS from Scala. So we're not looking to create a separate Scala client. Um, what we think down the track, we will create the other language clients. We actually, JET itself uses the same Hazelcast binary protocol. We added some extensions to it. So there's no reason why we can't extend other languages down the track. Maybe, maybe one that will be of great interest, I think, is probably Python. Yeah. All right, I'm out of time. Hey, thanks very much. Okay, so no plans to implement uh, SQL. Um, in terms of machine learning, um, we, that is, there is machine learning that you can use on top of cascading. So probably for us, the big question for us is whether we are going to release our cascading API. Um, well, not an API, so we introduce our um, cascading um, integration. If we do, then, you be, then there's a lot of machine learning that you can put on top of cascading, which already exists. But the concern is that cascading community has been declining. The startup that was backing it was called Driven. That folded last year. Um, and we'll have to see whether, you know, how healthy it is. We've done most of the work, so we could easily put, out, put it out there, and then you could do machine learning on top of Jet. Yeah. All right, hey, thanks very much, guys.